We, we live? All right, sweet. Well, sorry for the delay. There was a little scheduling mix-up here. Uh, this is Spark Hara, late but ready to go. And uh, I'm Michael McCune. I'm a developer with Red Hat, and I'm joined today by Chad Roberts, who's also a developer with Red Hat, and Nikita Konovalov, who's a developer with Mirantis. And uh, I'm going to start with a little disclaimer. Uh, what you're going to see, some of the code and the demonstrations that we're going to do are not upstream yet. Uh, just a fair warning. These are in GitHub repos. Uh, you can download them and uh, experiment at your own leisure. So what is Sparkara? Um, we started with an ambition to create a uh, heartbeat monitor for OpenStack based on the logs that are created from service controllers. Uh, this was also a way to dog food OpenStack so that we could use Sahara to deploy a data processing cluster and then consume the logs through Zakar and display them for someone to watch. Uh, it's also a silly name. So Sparkara. I don't know how we put it together, but it's a portmanteau of Spark and Sahara, and it just sounded funny to us. And also, we wanted to show um, a window into the possibilities of how you could analyze log data using Spark and then visualize it to see what's happening with a stack in real time. So you could see errors bubble up, or you could see uh, perhaps performance issues as they happen in real time. And why do we do this? Uh, we wanted to create a real-world use case, a user story that could show how you could consume these services to provide something for operators. Um, we also wanted to use kind of straightforward methodologies. There's a lot of technologies out there that can be used to you know, sort logs and accumulate them. We wanted to show how you could do it in just a straightforward manner. Uh, and we also wanted to kind of inspire all of you to take a look at this and say, hey, what can I do? Where can I take this? You know, the possibilities are endless. So what do we use to build it? Of course, we use the core services as, you know, we need to. Then we use uh, Sahara and Zakar and Trove. And on top of those, we use Spark and Zeppelin and the Mongo database. And we're going to get into how did we use these components and, uh, and what are they. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Nikita, and he's going to talk a little bit about Sahara and uh, Spark. OK. OK, thank you, Michael. So Sahara is an OpenStack service, and its main mission is to provide two components to the users. First of all, it provides a provisioning API, which allows users to spawn Hadoop clusters in minutes. And then when a user has its own cluster with Hadoop services running, Sahara provides a data processing API as well. So I'll go quickly about what makes Sahara and what is under the hood of these uh, components, and then we'll go through the demo. So uh, Sahara is a truly OpenStack service which exposes all its functionality through the RESTful API. This RESTful API is reachable by a Python client, which is an SDK to other pl applications if they want to use Sahara clusters. We also have CLI, so the Administrators can operate with this and do all the operations through the command line. Uh, from the user perspective, the dashboard in Horizon displays all the templates, all the jobs, and all the clusters that which are operable in Sakara with the ten tenant filtering, name filtering, and all the UX stuff you might want to have from a UI. Uh, of course, uh, Sakara is uh, uh, complex, uh, complex service which has a lot of components under the hood, so all of these components are checked in the OpenStack gate jobs, as well as the provisioned clusters are checked by third-party CIs for non-fake integration testing that allow to spin up Hadoop and check that it's really working in, a, in your OpenStack cloud. So let's go a bit deeper into the Sahara. It has a provisioning engine. So this is a component which decides how the, open, uh, how the Hadoop cluster is being provisioned on your, your cloud. Uh, the main goal of this uh, engine is to cover all underlying operations and uh, make them be provisioned automatically. The engine operates in steps, and all these steps are logged in our new uh, recent feature, which is event log, so the user can track how the provisioning is going. When the provisioning is finished, uh, the cluster is operable, but uh, it's not its final state. So the cluster is scalable, and user can 
uh, add or remove nodes depending on his workload and uh, change the name, uh, change the size and the services running in a cluster. Sahara also takes care about cleaning the resources when the cluster is not used anymore. So the deleting cluster will uh, remove all the VMs, volumes, uh, floating APs, and whatever has been created for this. And you leave your cloud free and clean. So the provisioning engine has been tested to, prov uh, to spawn a 200 node uh, VM cluster in a matter of tens of minutes. And uh, uh, we're actually right now in a process of migration to heat provisioning and this will allow more flexibility and more reliability when you're uh, provisioning a larger Hadoop clusters. So what is inside? Uh, what will be provisions? Uh, Sahara provisions the Hadoop in a plugins manner so there are dis different distributions and Sahara has plugins for each of them to provide a Hadoop uh, that suits mo your use case the most. So there is a vanilla plugin, which is uh, a an upstream Hadoop uh, build, built by Apache. And um, it is a reference implementation of what a plugin should look like. We also have a Clojure distribution and Hortonworks data platform being provisioned as a complex Hadoop distributions, which have uh, more than just Hadoop under the hood. And they are, are usually recommended for production use cases. There are a few solutions other than just pure Hadoop builds, which is a Spark platform, and we're going to talk more about it today. Uh, but uh, also, we have uh, Storm support appeared recently, which is the uh, best uh, scenario for streaming processing, and MapR with their MapRFS implementation is also available in Sahara. The versions for all of these components are, of course, different, and we're trying to keep them up to date with the recent releases. So the plugin and the Hadoop versions are almost always up to date with the current upstream of Hadoop. Then, so the Elastic Data Processing uh, is the component that uh, is responsible for running the workloads on an existing clusters. Basically, there are two types of workloads uh, Sahara can run today. Is that uh, The first one is uh, Hadoop MapReduce, and that's uh, Big Data Classics with its uh, big, and big queries, uh, high SQL-like queries, but also we allow to run any generic jar file or shell script. So if your job is compiled and uh, you have tested in a standalone Hadoop cluster, you can just submit it through EDP and it will run. Also, the second, uh, uh, second type of jobs, which are the streaming, and we have Spark and Storm plugins for those. And of course, Spark and Storm uh, uh, submission process is a bit different, but uh, it is available through all Sahara CLI, OpenStack dashboard, and other interfaces. So you can experiment with that. Now let's get uh, a bit closer to Spark and today's talk. So Apache Spark is a fairly new data processing engine. And uh, it is uh, one of its main advances is, is that it runs in a different modes. It's uh, not bound to any specific clustering engine. It has its own standalone mode, which is provisioned by vanilla Spark plugin. But it also can run on Yarn or Mesos uh, clustering, which uh, are supported by Yarn. Is, uh, Yarn and uh, uh, Yarn engine is supported by the Cloudera plugin. And uh, it is uh, being supported in HDB, but that support is in development right now. Uh, Spark is a bit different from Hadoop. It does not provide a storage layer, so it operates on the storage which is provided. And it is uh, not bound to a MapReduce concept, which is the matter in Hadoop. So uh, this is a just quick comparison on what are the main differences. And uh, these things you should think, think first when you decide which engine you would like to go, Hadoop or Spark. Uh, so in the case of uh, functionality provided again, so Hadoop is mainly built around MapReduce concept and it is doing it very well. So Spark is uh, uh, more ver provides you more variations. It has over 80 built-in functions for not only map and reduce, but also different filterings, multipassing, and other stuff. Uh, storage is uh, very important for big data processing and Hadoop uh, tries to store all its data on your persistent disk storage, which is uh, as good as you can configure, but 
this is the rely, uh, Hadoop relies on the storage for data processing, while Spark tries to keep as many data as it can in the RAM and run uh, the data processing in the RAM and only store when it's really necessary. As for the non MapReduce and streaming processing, uh, Hadoop has this possibility, but it's very limited to the that jar file which is provided by the Hadoop distributions and uh, Spark is way more advanced in stream processing because of the micro batching transaction functions and almost any possible data source that you can provide it. As for the scaling capabilities, both of these frameworks uh, declare to be infinitely scalable, which is uh, almost uh, uh, true but very hard to test because they are relying uh, on the network storage and other infrastructure, so usually the framework itself is not a limit to its scalability, it's other stuff. So, uh, that a question that is being asked very often when people are start comparing their Spark clusters to Hadoop, so is Spark always better, is it more, has, it has more functions, it is faster in RAM processing? The answer is, uh, the use case for each data processing job is different and you should see the benefits in both frameworks. But Spark is better when you have uh, uh, a reasonable amount of data and you have to do multiple passes while processing it. So when it fits in RAM, your choice is the Spark. And uh, Spark is always, almost always better for streaming support because it uh, has a richer data source support. Uh, as again I've said, Spark is uh, supported in Sahara as a standalone implementation is vanilla Spark plugin and CDH will provide you Spark running its containers on the Yarn system. HDB will be providing this functionality very soon. Uh, right now the standalone mode uh, runs uh, one of the uh, 0 or 3.1 Spark releases and Clojure also has 1.3 release which is uh, available from Clojera 5.4 distribution. Uh, the configuration is available through Sahara interface as well as the Hadoop configuration, so the core site and other env environmental options can be passed through the Sahara API. They can be stored in templates, so you can use, uh, uh, you can have the configuration that is reusable, and all of them are still provisioned automatically, so Sahara will handle everything like uh, provisioning the keys, uh, spawning up services, uh, formatting the storage and everything for Spark cluster, as well as the authentication for Keystone and Swift uh, data sources, which is required to run the data processing on OpenStack. The Spark workloads are available by ADP and Sahara uses Spark submit script under the hood. Uh, but that doesn't mean that your cluster is limited to this Spark submit tool because this uh, cluster is ready for any external tooling f that is ready to operate through Spark's APIs. So any Spark Python Java compile script or uh, shell script uh, will be executed either through Spark API, or EDP API or directly by user. It will run in the same LF fashion. Uh, so in case of the data sources that is supported by Sahara right now, there are HDFS and Swift, uh, Manila is coming soon, and uh, to talk more about how we can operate the data on the different data sources, I'd like to hand it back to Michael and tell you the exactly use case we're uh, trying to achieve with Spark and Sahara today. So, Michael. All right, thanks, Nikita. All right, so uh, we'll just go over Zeppelin is a, a web-based UI that allows you to interact with a Spark cluster. And uh, it's kind of like an IPython notebook. You can, uh, you can do visualizations. You can run code samples directly from your web browser. Uh, it also allows you to collaborate. So if I create a notebook that has some you know, particularly nice uh, algorithm, I could share that with Chad. And then uh, he could take it and run some visualizations, pass it back to me. And that, and that way, we can share in on uh, some of the live processing that we're doing. Uh, we also used uh, Trove to set up databases. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, Trove can do is it's a database as a service. You can deploy uh, relational or no SQL databases. 
uh, you know, you can do MySQL, Maria, Postgres, Mongo, Cassandra, Redis. It, it, it really simplifies deploying the database for you. Um, you can use it to create inst instances or clusters of, you know, for your databases. Um, and you can also use it to resize database volumes. There are some other operations that are available with uh, Trove. Um, you, know, you just have to kind of explore and see how you can copy databases, back them up, shard them, uh, those kind of things. And then we also use Zakar. Um, Zakar is OpenStack's messaging service. We used it as a queue uh, between multiple endpoints. Uh, it can work in multiple tenants. Uh, it has a RESTful API like the rest of the OpenStack services. And it supports uh, event broadcasting, task distribution, and point-to-point -point messaging. So you can you know, configure your endpoints so that something can push messages into the, que the queue. And then Zakar can uh, message the subscribers to let them know that a message has arrived for them. Or you can pull messages off the queue. So that, those are all the technologies we used uh, to kind of put this together. So the next part is you know, kind of what did we do? So the OpenStack service controllers create a lot of log data. And those logs have really useful information in them. But it can be difficult to kind of pick through them all. So in the Sparkara workflow, the OpenStack service controllers create the log data. And then we have a process that takes the log data and feeds it into a Zakar queue. And as it goes through the queue, we have another process sitting on the nodes with our Spark uh, processes. And they pull messages off the queue and feed it to Spark. Now, once Spark has got it, then we can do the processing. And you can hook in uh, Zeppelin. You could uh, normalize the data and send it to a database. We used Mongo. Uh, you can also send it out to just about anything you want. In this case, we used uh, an HTTP endpoint. Uh, Spark. Uh, is pretty flexible in what you can do. You're not limited to just a MapReduce kind of interaction. You can you know, do whatever you want to on the data that comes in. And so to prepare for this, we needed to create some custom images. And this is where the, the disclaimers and provisos come in. Uh, we were using Spark 1.5, which is one of the latest versions out there. And we created some custom images that we could deploy through Sahara to talk on these. We also needed to configure DevStack to add in the Zakar plugin and the Trove plugin uh, so that they were available to us. And then uh, we needed to customize the Sahara cluster operations a little bit so that they could deal with Spark 1.5, because right now, uh, Sahara is only using up to Spark 1.3. So just had to tweak it a little bit so that we could get these, these new images in there. So the next part was moving the log data. The first thing that we did was configure the controllers so that the, the logs were formatted in a way that was easy to consume on the endpoints. The next step is reading the log files, because they're just existing as files on a, on a server somewhere. And we need to move them to Zakar. So we wrote a small Python application that just tailed those log files and pushed the data onto Zakar. So here's an example of, of how the controller might be configured. In this case, it was the Sahara controller. Um, we just basically told it to output to a log file in opt logs. And then the next four lines are where things get interesting. That's where we started to, to format how we want the messages to come across. And really, we just went with a simple approach using a double colon to separate between various fields of the log. So the, the date time stamp, uh, what the process ID was, you know, what, what uh, kind of level came back from the log, what was the log message, et cetera. Now, reading the logs. This is where the, the, the Python application that was sitting on the same node as the controller, it, it could be sitting anywhere as long as it can access the logs. We just ran this command, let it tail the logs as they happened. And instead of making it a multi-threaded approach, we just went with a single process per log, start it up, and have them feed the logs into Zakar. In those processes, we would then hand off to Zakar. So we just wanted to take a, you know, a simple approach to this. Just tail the file for every line that's created. Just send that line straight to Zakar. Um, there are probably better ways you could do this. You could use more complicated technologies, but we just wanted to keep it simple. Also, tagging the service type. This is something that the approach we took was to, to based on uh, what socket was being used, we could identify what service was, was sending their logs in. There are other ways we could have done this. We, we, could have we could have tagged the service at the point where the log logs were read and sent them up as, as something more complicated. But we just wanted to keep it as simple log lines coming across. 
And then log line kind of chunking was a problem we came into where sometimes when you get an error, uh, a service controller, if it's configured in debug mode, will send a stack trace. And those stack traces don't come out cleanly formatted. So we needed to make sure that, that those would get uh, compiled into a packet that could be sent across to Zakar as a whole so that it didn't appear out of order when it came uh, onto Spark. So receiving and processing. This is, this is happening on the Spark nodes. And the Spark nodes need to be able to listen to a Zakar queue and then take from the Zakar queue and push them into the socket streaming endpoints for Spark. And then you have, you have choices about what you want to do with the data at this point, because this is another area where things could get split up or sliced in a way that may not be advantageous. We went, again, we went with a simple approach of just getting these log packets across, take the whole packet, and send it to, uh, to Spark. So receiving the data, again, we had another small Python application that we would run once per service that we wanted to listen for. And in this case, you can see we just set it up for the port we wanted to send it to so that Spark knew what service and what queue was based on you know, the service type that we wanted to send it across. We, we could have put all the messages into the same queue and tagged the data before we put it into Zakar. But again, this was the first approach we took. It may not have been the best. Um, and then this application would move the information from the Zakar queue onto the same node where the Spark uh, application was living. So feeding Spark. There are, there are different ways we, we can get information out of Zakar. Uh, we chose just a simple approach of looping and reading the queue to see if new messages were available. And if not, we just sleep and then you know, wait for a new message to be available. We could have used the V2 uh, Zakar API to set up a subscription model where Zakar would have sent us log messages as they occurred. Now, sending the messages to Spark is where we get into uh, how Spark processes incoming data. There is not a Zakar socket streaming method for Spark at this moment. So we had to use a text socket stream, which basically reads new line separated lines that come across the socket and forms them into RDDs, which are the, the basic primitive of, of Spark's processing. So it would. Based on a time slice, Spark would read some number of lines that came in on a socket, and then it would ship those off into an RDD to be processed. This is, this is where things could, could possibly slow down because of the way that we're separating the messages, how we're, how we're feeding them to Spark. There's a lot of timing issues involved here, and it, it gets pretty deep in the weeds, but yeah, <laughs> you'll see. <laughs> so we've got some data. It's in Spark now. What do we want to do with it? This is part of the Spark application we wrote. And as the log lines come in, one of the things we want to do is normalize the data. So you saw before we use the double colons to, to separate the fields. We want to break them apart now. And we're going to turn them into a uh, JSON object that we can put into Mongo. So first we normalized it. Then we could store the data. You could put it into Mongo. You could, you could build a more complicated schema if you felt like it and put it into a, a more structured database. Then you could also signal an external application. Th this is kind of the next step after we stored it. We, took the, we wanted to say, how would anyone know that this data was stored in the database if they weren't just you know, looking at the database? So we wanted to signal an outside process, in this case, an HTTP endpoint, that new data had arrived. We don't want to send all the log lines to this endpoint. We just wanted to let it know that new logs were available and some number of them had arrived, and that here's the IDs. They can be grabbed from the database. There are other things we could have done with this, too. We could have used uh, other services to initiate actions based on information that was coming in. Uh, Spark could have been set up to, to signal an external server that you know, something had just happened and, and you needed to take action. Maybe send an email to an operator to let them know that a bunch of error messages had just arrived and maybe you should look at your stack. The, the options are really endless here. Spark is very open in what it allows you to do. So normalizing, you know, what do we want to store? How should we store it? We went with a very simple approach again, just packaging up the log files and pushing them into Mongo. And just it, the way we put them into Mongo was we stamped a time on them. We put the count of the log lines that had come in within that RDD. And then, Mark, was there an error in that packet? 
and then the log line. So we just shipped each one of those packets to Mongo, which made it easy to consume on the, on the other end. So storing, signaling, you know, wherever you want to take this. Getting the data out of Spark is the next point. And, and like I said, we just kind of packaged this up, pushed it into Mongo. We signaled the listener on an HTTP endpoint to let it know new, new information had showed up. We could have also pushed this information back to a Zakar queue, which probably would have been a better approach uh, because it could have been consumed by more services then. Um, again, this was the first stab we took. Next time, maybe we'll put it on the queue. So now we're going to get into how did we visualize the data. So at this point, Spark has taken the data. It's normalized it. We've put some of it into the Mongo database. And what else are we going to do with it? We've sent some to an HTTP endpoint. We've also got Zeppelin set up. And the data is available to us. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Chad. And he's going to talk a little bit about Zeppelin. OK, so uh, one of the tools that we used to uh, visualize and explore uh, the data from Mike's app was Zeppelin. Um, so recall from an earlier slide, uh, Zeppelin is our web-based UI, kind of IPython notebook-like to let you kind of uh, fail quickly, which I did a lot of, um, and iterate based on that. Um, I see there's two kind of basic use cases that, that I used and, and uh, kind of uh, went with on this. The rapid interactive development for the data exploration, kind of see what you got, play with it a little bit, see what you can maybe make out of it. Uh, Zeppelin works really well for that. Um, and the other part, um, it also comes with some kind of very cheap and free um, visualizations. It'll give you some charts. Um, and you can do quick, simple reporting with that. Um, when you get a chart in Zeppelin, you can actually just take a link. You can link that paragraph they're called there. And you can send that to somebody else. And they get essentially like a read-only version so they can see the chart and they can if you update it it'll update their chart um, live for them even if they're looking at it um, so it's kind of a quick nicety um, that Zeppelin can give you um, so for this example um, Spark Hara we took the data from Mike's app that was uh, loaded into Mongo um, hosted by Trove um, let's see. oh then uh, <laughs> the Sahara tie-in um, Spark was of course running on Sahara um, and then we'll show you a quick, uh, simple chart that was created that is, of course, shareable. Um, the first thing in Zeppelin here, um, and this isn't necessarily Spark Hara related. Um, this is just a quick, you know, hello world sort of thing um, in Zeppelin. This is showing the uh, Spark Pi example. If you're familiar with Spark, I'm sure you've probably seen it on the uh, Spark documentation. Um, it just calculates pi uh, using the uh, what Monte Carlo method, I think it is. Um, the, the top paragraph there is um, using Scala. Um, and, and the bottom paragraph is doing the same thing, but using PySpark. Um, the bottom paragraph, you can see there's the, it starts with percent PySpark. That just lets it know that you're invoking the, the Python interpreter. Um, Scala on the top, um, it's the default, so you don't really need uh, to put the percent anything. If you wanted to, you can put uh, percent uh, spark there. Um, so then we get into the more Spark Hara bit. Um, and so one of the use cases was to quickly look at our data and maybe play with it a little bit. So what we do here, um, the first few lines, you can see we're, we're grabbing the, the data from our Mongo database. We're just kind of sucking it in. Um, and we're going to create a, uh, a data frame. Um, and, and if you're not familiar with Spark, uh, a data frame, just think of it as kind of a, uh, um, a database table that you can, it has columns and you can query on it. Um, but it's not really a database. So um, don't tell anybody that I told you it's a database. Um, so here we just quickly, we slurped it in. And we uh, displayed the columns that were created in our data frame. So we can see that our data has uh, a count, some errors, uh, some log messages, a uh, timestamp, and a, uh, a service that's created along with it there. Um, and then we also ran a quick query, the last line um, before the output starts there. Um, we can just see, that I, and we had, we're doing this on two services, it looks like. Um, Sahara, we had a lot of log messages from. Um, hopefully, it was a good day, not a bad day for Sahara. Um, and Neutron, the, there was a, a few messages also processed there. Um, this one, I, hopefully, yeah, you can read it. We're at the big screen here. Um, a lot of this, again, um, is some boilerplate at the top. Getting the data from Mongo again, loading it into uh, an RDD. Um, 
the bottom part of this is where I'm actually doing something a little more interesting with the data, um, grouping it into like time buckets. Um, the, the, uh, the thought here is I'm going to be making a chart out of this, so I'm going to kind of creating uh, some time series sort of data that you can easily chart. Um, there's a little bit of extra code here that doesn't really, um, we're not making all the charts that I originally have done in a different version of this talk. Um, we're just going to be showing one of the charts. So some of this code is a little extraneous for, uh, for our purposes today. Um, but it's fairly basic uh, um, PySpark stuff. Nothing too magical there, really. Um, so we've loaded all of our data into this uh, data frame. Um, here is how we make a chart. It's just uh, we have uh, four lines of code um, to generate all this magic. Um, percent SQL, this lets us know we're going to be doing um, you know, uh, a query here. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, select on the uh, hourly errors. Um, that was the, the table, the data frame that I created. Um, and you notice that there's a drop down there. Um, so Sahara is the currently selected service. Uh, there's a little bit of code there, but um, you can see where service equals, and then there's some braces. You can actually create drop downs. You can create text boxes that the user can dynamically enter and change the query, and the graph will update as soon as you change that. Um, so it, it, you know, that's quite a bit of functionality to get in just a few lines there, um, and it takes you know this whole thing probably just took a, a few minutes to create really, and you could probably do it quicker because you're probably a better uh, Spark coder than I am. Um, so, what else can Zeppelin do? I, I, couldn't, I didn't want to do a whole demo on Zeppelin. Um, it has interpreters for Spark, PySpark, uh, SQL Hive, Flink, Cassandra, lots of other things. It's open source. Um, you can, you know, if there's a framework you want it to work with, you're, f you know, at it. I'm sure they'd love to have it. Um, dynamic dependency loading. We actually did that. Um, the, the drivers to extract the Mongo data. Um, you can load those drivers kind of runtime. You don't have to even have them on your system. Um, uh, Zeppelin will go out and grab them for you. Um, it can handle streaming jobs. If you're interested in Zeppelin, you can go and run their tutorials. Um, there's a really cool Twitter-based example. It'll grab a bunch of Twitter feeds, and you can see what other people are tweeting. Um, not all safe for work tweets. Don't make the mistake I did. Um, you can load other charting libraries. If you're not ha happy with uh, the, the basic charting they give you, you can use Angular and grab your own charting library and, and use that. There's examples for that, I think, maybe on the, uh, the user list. Um, if you wanted uh, um, to lo um, run your notebooks via a set schedule, you could also do that. There's options in the UI um, for that. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, for reporting, you can provide links to the individual paragraphs. Um, and share them like that. Um, yeah, the last thing, of course, uh, <laughs> the little caveat here, Zeppelin's not built into the Spark plugin for Sahara by default. Um, there's a few options you have to get it, though. None of them are that extensive. Uh, you, it's fairly simple to just install and start manually. So if you started a regular Sahara cluster um, with Spark, you could just log into that cluster and install it yourself. Um, I have a couple of uh, repos um, that you could run. Um, one, uh, the Sahara image elements lets you build the image with uh, Zeppelin already on it. Um, and the Sahara one is a slightly tweaked version of Sahara, or the uh, Spark plugin that will start the Zeppelin process for you. Um, not necessary if you want to just do it yourself, though. Um, and also, there is a community uh, contributed plugin for Ambari that will also uh, start up Zeppelin for you. Um, so with that, we go back to Mike for some more visualization. All right. Thanks, Chad. OK, so we've seen what Zeppelin can do. What did we do? We rolled our own. Um, we built a small Flask server that, as I mentioned before, was getting hit by Spark, s telling it that there was updated log information in the MongoDB. Uh, we used D3JS to do the visualizations. Uh, and we also had some non-visual receivers. So learning about information that was coming in from the Spark server, but not necessarily visualizing it. If you wanted to just hear that, OK, some errors had arrived in your system, maybe it's time to send an email to an operator to let them know, you know, check out what's going on. And then beyond that, 
you could also script actions that come in off of this. So you don't just need to visualize it. You could actually create your own scripting out of this. So maybe if you knew that a certain type of log message was going to come through and you wanted something to happen based off that, you could set your Spark app up and have it send to a, to a scripted action that might do more things. It might tell Nova to shut down or it might, you know, it might lock the system down. Who knows? This, way, this is just a small example of one of the applications we wrote. In this one, um, what's happening is all the logs, the logs from two services are being, are being collected here. Um, the top graph shows you a total count of all the logs coming in, and the bottom count shows you a graph based on two services. The, the orange colored line is uh, Sahara's logs. So most of the time, Sahara's pretty quiet. It doesn't do much. It runs a periodic task, and you see a little blip there. The top one is Neutron, which is kind of noisy sometimes. So Neutron's kicking out lots of information for us. And then you see around the, the 50 second mark is where we started to do an operation with Sahara. We started to, to tell it to register an image. And what you can see with the red line on the top is an error has arrived. And in the bottom pane here, you can see that we've clicked on that. And now the error has shown up, and you've seen it. So this is one example. I'm going to. Hopefully, the demo gods will be nice to me, and I'm going to show you another example. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, this is all going to be run on my local machine. So I'm not using DevStack. I'm not using an external cloud service. I'm just going to run it here for the purposes of this demonstration. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a Keystone server on my machine, and I'm going to visualize uh, login attempts that are happening in real time. So what's going to happen is, I'm going to start some services here. And the first thing I'll do is I'll start up uh, the Flask application that will do the visualization. And I'm going to start up this application that will feed log information from Keystone to that. And then I'm going to start the Spark application. Now at this point, I'm going to have to drop out of presentation mode here. All right, all I have at this point is just a graph. Nothing's happening. You, you can see that, um, let me see here. If I, if I go back to here, Keystone's not creating any logs right now. And hence, we don't see anything happening on here. No, no logs are being generated. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a process that will, that will create login attempts. And what it's going to do is it's going to look like someone's just logging in. They're validating normally. It's successful. And every once in a while, someone will miss their password. So once every 10 to 20 seconds, there'll be a failed login attempt. All right, so at this point, we're starting to see some activity come through. And what you're, and what you're seeing on the, the blue line is valid logins. And there we go. Someone has, someone's forgotten their password at this point or something. Someone's failed a login attempt. So I'm going to come here, and, and I'm going to attempt to click on that. This is, and if I scroll down, I can see the logs, the logs have populated here. And I'll scroll through, and I say, OK, warning, there's been a, a failed login attempt. OK, you know, I look at these logs. We scroll back up, and it, it doesn't look like it's that bad. There's, there's been very little activity here. So probably someone forgot their password. Now they're, they log back in. It was no big deal. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to simulate uh, someone trying to brute force a password. So what, you're gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have it create um, 10, 20, 30, 40 bad login attempts per second over several seconds. And we'll see if we can visualize it. OK, so now we're seeing some activity. We're seeing a bunch of invalid login attempts. And what's happening is, first of all, Keystone's gotten really noisy because there's a bunch of activity happening. But we're also seeing that, OK, what, what the heck is all this? And why have all these, why have all these bad login attempts started to happen? So if I, if I click on one of these, and, and I can work this like this, OK. So you can see that, all right, we're looking at logs, and they're being sorted. And we can see that, OK, there's something happening you know, in real time, these things are, these things are being interleaved. We we're seeing bad login attempts. And if I needed to, I could come down and click on one of these points. And this will be very challenging based on this. But there we go. 
And now you're seeing just all the, all the errors uh, collated together based on time. So if, if we needed to look and see, you know, all right, what, what just happened, you know, we could go back through these logs and look at it that way. And so this is one example of how you could use this to, to work on the logs that are coming through Spark. In this case, all I did was separate all the login attempts and just look for, look for the keywords of warning and, uh, you know, you've made a, re a request that requires authentication. So it was a very simple approach to just picking out those log lines and informing that something has happened. And, we, you know, we can hit another one if we want to just for fun. All right, so where does that leave us? If I can get back into presentation mode. All right. So having said all that and shown you the demo, what, what did we learn from this? Um, PySpark works really well. Uh, it was pretty enjoyable to write the application in PySpark because it was Python. It was very easy to interact with all the pieces of OpenStack. We could use OpenStack clients. As long as we had them loaded on the Spark nodes, PySpark could access them. Um, the OpenStack Python clients. I, you know, arigato gozaimasu to all the OpenStackers who work on those things because they all worked beautifully. It was very easy to use them. And then manipulating the log data was also easy. Using the Oslo logging engine, it was very easy to separate the, uh, the log lines. It was easy to break them up and feed them back through to our database and, and normalize them in Spark. That all worked great. Things that could have worked better. Um, Image creation is still a really big issue. And whether we're creating images for Sahara or we're creating images for Trove, we still have to package these images and then deploy them to the cluster. And we ran into a lot of difficulty, in some cases, getting the images to build properly. Um, I don't want to name names, so I'm not going to. So what next? Um, this was all pretty custom built. And we injected a lot of the, the routing and the pathways by hand. We could increase the integration between these components. Uh, and when I say creating OpenStack applications, what I mean is that if we had written this at a, as a Python application that interacted separately with Sahara and Trove and all the different pieces, we could have had it pull IDs for the different components and put them all together automatically rather than, rather than us having to write the individual pieces and plug all the endpoints in. This could have all been done from an application that sat at a higher layer than even Sahara and would have interacted with the cloud in the same way. And it could have even injected values into our Spark uh, application. So with all that being said, does it scale? Um, we didn't get to the point where we could test the car at a large enough level that we could say, all right, here's 10,000 logs a second. Can it handle it? I'm pretty sure Spark can handle it, especially if we scaled out the Spark cluster. But it's, it's difficult to tell if, it, if that would have happened purely with the solution that we were using. So if you're thinking about building something like this and you wanted to grow it out to scale, you might look at some of these other technologies. Kafka is a, a queue mechanism that you could use in place of Zakar. FluentD and Logstash are ways to aggregate logs and uh, you know, transform them and do work on them. InfluxDB is a way to, to store log information in, similar, in a similar manner to Logstash. Kibana would have been an option to visualize this had we been using Elasticsearch. And then Grafana would have been another way to visualize this if we didn't want to write our own custom you know, D3JS application. So I think we've come to the end of the road. Any questions? <laughs> all right, well, thank you all very much. Go visit the Red Hat booth. Go visit the Marantis booth. <laughs>